From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Brad White, Bob Larson, and Dustin Pindle will team up to discuss three current subjects of interest for you cow-calf producers. They look at fly control strategies for herds out on summer grass, risk management as it applies to the cow-calf operation and tools that you producers can use to help you contend with that risk, and monitoring bulls routinely throughout the remainder of the breeding season, looking for any physical issues those bulls might have. All that's next. Later, K-State's Charlie Lee will talk about how to take inventory of the fish that reside in your farm pond for purposes of developing a more well-balanced fish population. Plus more coming up on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Welcome once again. Well, if you're a regular listener to our broadcast, you're aware that every week we draw highlights from what has, in its short history, become a highly informative resource for you beef cattle producers. The K-State researchers and specialists who make up the Beef Cattle Institute here at the university produce the BCI Cattle Chat Podcast. We Weekly, they gather around the BCI microphones and take up current topics in cattle health management, in genetics, and economics. Their latest edition covers a cross-section of very timely topics, so today we're bringing you the podcast in its entirety. Contributing this week, veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson and livestock economist Dustin Pendle. Here's Brad to run through the podcast agenda. We're going to talk about a couple different things today. We're going to talk about flies because we're coming right up on fly season. We're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about risk management. Risk management is really important if you're a cow-calf or stalker or feedlot, different types of risk management. And Dustin's going to give us some information there. And then finally, we're going to talk about bulls. So the bulls are out, and we talked about before. Let's get them ready to go out into the breeding season. So toward the end here, we're going to talk about what do I do now? They're out there with the cows. Anything specific I want to follow up with? But I want to start, and and we here locally this weekend, we have a few calves around our house, and we actually are starting to see quite a few flies. So it's that time of year. Bob, I'm going to ask you to start out with, when we talk about flies and cattle, a couple main types that we think about. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, particularly for for pasture cattle, we're concerned about uh, horn flies and face flies. Those are the two most common that are, that are going to cause us some problems. They're they're fairly different. Horn flies are very very small. They spend their time on the cattle, take blood meals, cause a lot of irritation, and deposit their eggs in manure. All right, face flies are different. They're they're a large fly. They actually fly long distances. They spend a lot of their time off of the cattle. And uh, they are going to be around the face. And they don't really take blood meals, but they're, they're eating the secretions and causing irritation around the eyes and eating that. So face flies around the face, which makes sense from naming. So horn flies are probably around the horns. No, they aren't. I don't know who was in charge of the naming. <laughs> <laughs> but they're along the side, <laughs> along the belly. And, and they will spend some time on the pole. But, but not much. But not much. On the side. You're seeing them on the side of the cat. I'm not sure who named them horn flies, but they, they missed their, their landmark a little bit there. Maybe his name was horn. Maybe so. But the face flies look like common house fly. Yeah, they're a and large. The horn fly would be small. And, they're, and the horn flies are very small. Okay. And as far as relative numbers, mm. how many, like if I say a lot of face flies, how many am I? Oh, more than five. You know, okay. so it's, it's a handful or, you know, so would look like a lot of face flies. When you're looking at horn flies, you're talking about hundreds of flies. Okay. And so, yeah, very, you know, they're both flies, 
Uh, but what they're doing to the cattle, how they're eating, you know, blood meals versus, you know, secretions around the eyes, the which location one? on the animal, they're pretty different. Which one's eating the blood meal? The horn flies. Okay. So those are the ones that we're talking about irritation. They're causing the cattle to be a little bit upset and can cause some weight loss, other other problems? Yes, that's exactly right. That's what we're concerned about them because they change their grazing behavior. They change their, um, you know, they're taking blood meals. They, they can cause, you know reduce performance so they're really an irritant causing some direct problems face flies their real main issue is that they can contribute to pink eye if you're not really having pink eye problems you're not having a lot of face fly problems so even if there are some face flies around but you're not seeing any overt disease on those cattle any eye problems they're not causing what we could measure as decreased weight gain or anything like that so they're much less of a problem unless they're associated with pink eye and then pink eye can be quite a challenge so they're feeding more on like the tears or the secretions from the animal and typically that's why they're staying around the face so they're not eating blood right that is correct and that's how they can transfer some of those things like pink eye yeah exactly right you said the horn flies can cause some problems some weight loss but not at low levels. So yeah. typically, is there is there a threshold or a rule of thumb that we say if there's this many could yeah, the, be a problem? The threshold that I've always heard is if there's two to three hundred on a side, mainly because you can only see one side at a time. It's time or past time to institute some fly control measures. So early in the season, when there's starting to be just a few, the parasitologist really advises us to wait just a little bit longer before you start your fly control. And and the whole reason behind that is there's concerns about uh, resistance to some of the chemicals we use and so we want to use those really optimally we want to use them the best way possible so don't necessarily start fly control for horn flies right when you see the first flies but as there as those numbers start to build uh, the, and they can build relatively quickly you need then need to be ready to jump in with some fly control and this is an area that as we think about fly control and controlling those because you told us there's some differences in the life cycle and where they live so the the horn flies on the cattle feeding from the cattle it makes sense i'm going to do something with the cattle the face flies they're actually more in the environment yeah. so is there something i i need to do it makes face fly control with some of our chemicals more difficult because they don't spend that much time on the animal. So they're not going to, you know, so if we have ear tags or, you know, a dust bag or, or a spray, any way we're getting the chemicals on cattle to control flies, the face flies just aren't spending that much time around. They actually spend most of their time off of the cattle in vegetation and things like that. And so it makes it a little bit more challenging to uh, probably not going to actually kill them with the insecticides a lot of times what we're trying to do is repel them and just keep them away from the face so they spend even less time around the cattle but there's some things we want to do environmental management wise so i I mentioned we're starting to see some flies at at our place and and it's because we've got standing water we've had enough rain here that we've got some standing water we've got some areas that as much as you can try to control and clean up it makes it very challenging, even if you put fly control on the cattle, to, to manage that face fly population. Yeah, it, it really does. The, the face flies are, are a challenge because they spend so much time off the cattle. And that's where the, the horn flies are different. They spend almost their entire life cycle on the animal. The only time they really get off very much is to go uh, lay some eggs in fresh manure pads. Uh, so they're going to spend most of their time right around the cattle, which is a, a good thing from a chemical control standpoint because they're near the insecticides that we want to use so again no matter how we deliver them and so oilers dust bags sprays porons or ear tags they're around the chemical a lot and we can decrease the load that has also caused some problems over time some development of some resistance in those animals so again in the uh, flies in the flies i I said animals i should have said flies so resistance in the flies if they're exposed to the same chemical for multiple generations and they'll have multiple generations in one summer fly season and so work closely with your veterinarian kind of keep track of the products that have worked well in the past and when they stop working well be ready to change and so best fly control practices involve using our chemicals wisely uh don't use them more than we have to you know so basically i'm saying it's 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 challenging and it's hard to do it really well. Work closely with veterinarians, uh, extension specialists, those that that are familiar with your local area. But when a local a herd just across the fence from another can have a different problem as far as 
uh, resistance to to the chemicals. So that we're two using. two things that I heard from what you said, and one is have a strategy. Put those things together in the right package. Have a plan, and two, keep good records because yeah, I, I got to remember how well my fly control worked last year. And sometimes my brain is getting to the point where I can't necessarily tell last year from the year before, and and so. Keep some records. Keep track of how well your fly control is working. And then take that information to someone that can help you uh, pick the best products. And and what you used and when is going to be important parts of that record. Because I I find myself, it's easy to say, well, they've, they've got flies. Let's run through and we might do this or that. And that's something that we need to write down so that I can go back and evaluate it. Because exactly. without records, I can't modify it for next year because it, it may be different as it goes forward. Oh, I, I expect it to be different. I think you're going to have to make adjustments as time goes along. So keeping some records of the products and the timing that you've used is very important. The other thing I want to visit briefly, as you said, there's multiple methods of application. So we can use fly tags. We can use pour-ons. We can use dust bags. There's lots of different ways. And there's different products that we can put in there. So that that should all be part of your strategy is how you – because you probably don't want to use all those, and there may be different ones that fit your operation. Oh, it, exactly. And, you know, the tags are very convenient. You put them in one time and don't have to worry about it for a long time. But they are probably the, the method of delivery that we have a little more trouble with resistance with because they are in, in those animals for a long time. I really do like some of the delivery type methods like oilers and dust bags and things like that where – I can kind of control when the the chemical starts being placed on the cattle and when it stops. But those take a lot more labor and don't always work with our grazing situations. So you got to think about each ranch, each herd as an individual challenge to figure out the best fly control plan. Absolutely. And And I think those are good tips. So think about it as we come into fly season. Wait until we get to a little bit later in the season and you have enough burden to make it worthwhile treating those animals. And keep track of what you do this year. And did it work or did it not work? And we can adjust that strategy next year. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So great plans on flies. After this break, we'll have more from this week's BCI Cattle Chat podcast, venturing into risk management in its various forms for the cow-calf herd, and monitoring bulls here well into the breeding season. Dustin Pendle, Bob Larson, and Brad White will rejoin us in just a moment. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Resuming now on Agriculture Today, the conversation from the BCI Cattle Chat podcast out of K-State. Again, Brad White, Dustin Pendle, and Bob Larson talking up on this segment a couple of other subjects of interest to you beef cattle producers. Again, here's Brad. Next topic, we want to talk a little bit about risk management. And Dustin, I'm going to let you jump in and and tell us a little bit about what are the different types of risks and types of strategies. Maybe just to recap the different types of agriculture risks. Oh, so, well, I think listening to my farm report every morning, I think of price risk management. You know, okay. the guys that yep. are buying yep. futures and options and, and, you know, they're controlling their risk by doing some of the, the marketing risk. Absolutely. That's one right. type of risk. I mean, there's a lot of other risks. So I think as we've gone through this winter, we've had weather uncertainty or risk and that's tied to production type risk so we've lost some calves or we had some calves that came through this winter a little bit tough those are two types of things that are that are worries so production risks so anything related to diseases pests weather anything any factors that's probably relating to quality and or quantity so production risk and you, and you gotta risk you gotta think about policies such as yeah. some of the tariff issues that are going on right now and, and how so that's impacting agriculture. Institutional risk. Yep. Anything that's related to government, it's, it's more than just the tariffs. But yeah, that's the one that's driving the news at the moment. We can think maybe financial risk is another one. 
Yeah. You've got to borrow money. Interest rates could be going up. So that's another type of risk that sometimes you hear people talk about. Yeah, those of us that are old enough to remember to kind of remember the crisis in the 80s, that was more of a, a financial risk Right, yeah, with issue. The interest, rates, interest rates and whatnot. Uh, the other one I would think of is something to do with labor. I mean, labor is mm. pretty big in agriculture, oh. and if you can't... If I can't get labor. You can't get labor, it's that's an issue. So I don't know what, if it's labor, I mean, I don't know what the, the title of that would be. But uh, another one I've seen before is like human accident, death, uh, a big one we've been, you know, one that I think with the economy the way it is, ag economy, maybe divorce mm-hmm. uh, is, is another example. That can, so, that can cause serious stress on the farming operation as far as ownership and well, just lots of different ways. Absolutely. So those are, I guess, some of the risks. So that that's broader than just my uh, farm market report in the morning on the way into work. It's probably a little bit, yeah. yeah. Now, when we think about your uh, farm market report, price risk, uh, marketing risk, a couple things just to think about there is there are some tools which producers can use to try to mitigate that type of risk. There's You mentioned the, the futures, options, markets as an example. Yeah, that would be one way to try to reduce risk. Uh, maybe forward contracting would be maybe another type of uh, way to do, reduce that. We could also participate in. There's a couple uh, insurance products: the LRP, the livestock risk protection, and then the uh, livestock gross margin would be another one as well. Mm-hmm. And so those are a couple insurance products. But anytime you're going to participate in, I think anything, you need to know what your production cost. You need to know what your costs are. You have to know what your costs are because you need to, need to know what your break-even is. Uh, you also probably need to know what your level of risk is mm-hmm. and how much risk are you willing to take. And so that's both personality and also just my financial position as well. Exactly. No, yeah, you need to know from a, from your farm standpoint how much risk can you take because, yeah, you risk going out of business. So on either the insurance programs or you talk about options, futures, right. some of those things, do I expect if I'm a producer that if I use those tools, I will make more money? Are they profit driving tools or are they so, protection? So, type if you're tools? participating in, let's say, the futures market, whether it's futures or options, I mean, that's a way to try to reduce the risk. So, you're not necessarily looking to make money, you're just trying to reduce the losses. Uh, so, I don't know that I would use that as a way to go out and try to make money because it'd be more like a speculator, a speculator, speculator at that point, so it, right? So, it would be, so I'm, I am spending some cost but you said i had to, i need to know break even so i'm going to add a little bit on my cost side of the equation to purchase some of these tools but it's going to limit my downside if i'm concerned about price yeah. risk so for example your lrp right you're concerned that if the u.s announces we have a bse and right. we lose all markets and all of a sudden markets fall that's when you would have that type of insurance product mm-hmm. to help on that downside because the markets, markets are always changing. And one of the things that, that we've had conversations or I've had conversations with some of the feed yards or stocker operations, some of them will use some of these risk management tools, whereas our cow-calf operations, you may not see as many of them. Some of them do use some tools right. and some forward pricing. Any differences or distinctions there? Because those operations, some of them, cow-calf, you're marketing once or twice couple times a year whereas some of the other operations you're marketing more throughout the year yeah there's a lot of of, of different uh, rev- opportunities to participate in the different types of insurance products but some of those could apply to cow calf operations absolutely and, and and i don't know and i don't know what the exact numbers are what participate but i know the cow calf operations there's there's fewer people fewer. that participate mm-hmm. and we we've talked about last few weeks on the number of operations of people who have less yeah. than 20 head well, their risk management is the fact that they're not putting their family income but, at, at risk. And they're, then that's maybe but that's it. very different than someone where right. it's... Right. Uh-huh. But the LRP, you can participate with even fewer... I mean, so futures and options, you have set contracts. And I think that's one nice thing with the LRP and the livestock gross margin uh, insurance products. Those are maybe geared for more small to medium-sized producers that don't necessarily are going to... So if I, want, if I want to market. know more information on this, so where, can I, where can I go find out more? There's especially? a lot of information out there on the web. And so if you want to read some fact sheets through the USDA Risk Management Agency, they have them that explain the insurance products. Uh, there are websites that have tools. And I know Glenn Tonzer, and actually before him, it was Kevin Duvetter, developed a tool, a spreadsheet that compared, I think it was LRP to maybe futures and options. Uh, so if you go to agmanager.info, you can find that. 
I know uh, Iowa State's uh, Ag Econ Extension, they also have some tools for, it's more than just cattle, it looks, looks at swine as well, and some of these various insurance products as well. So there's a lot of tools available. I would start with your probably your Langrant University's Extension website. And if you can't find it, then you could probably come to uh, K-State's, go to agmanager.info. And we still talked about one type of risk, but I think the others are worth yeah. considering. And, and there's some other things that you do to control. We talked about price risk, but the production risk, some of the others, very similar to our fly discussion in the concept of have a strategy, yeah. and then track what worked this year. You know, I get the opportunity to, to deal with a lot of people in agriculture, a lot of farmers and ranchers, and I'm impressed by uh, some of the people that I get to interact with that spend quite a bit of time thinking about risk management and thinking about, and not just price risk, but right. all these other risks as well, labor, family, financial. And I think that's that's the type of thinking that can easily get shoved to the side when I'm busy. I'm busy calving and planting and i'm busy doing a lot of things and so this this risk management can take a i'll do that later attitude and and i'm impressed with the producers that have the discipline to include that in their daily thinking no absolutely and i and i think we've only talked about the price but i think we could each we could spend just as much time talking whether it's production or the human personal risk i think each one like you're saying deserves that proper amount of time Excellent. So the, one of the last things we wanted to talk about was uh, I've got the bulls turned out. Is there anything I should do now? You know, one of the things that we, we've emphasized the need to do a pre-breeding season, breeding soundness exam, to make sure that the bulls are sound, fertile, ready to go out. But there's a lot of things that can go wrong once the bull is turned out. Uh, you can have foot and leg issues. You can The bull can get sick due to a number of different diseases. He can become injured in the act of mating. And most, the good thing is most of the problems that can happen after a bull's been turned out, I can see with my eyes, or at least I can see evidence of with my eyes. So if a bull doesn't look healthy, he's losing a lot of weight, he just doesn't look like he's thriving, he might, he might have respiratory disease, he might have anaplasmosis, he might have something that's certainly going to affect his fertility. Feet and leg issues are pretty common in bulls, and so if he's not moving around well, that would be a reason why he's not going to be a successful breeder no matter what his pre-breeding examination revealed and so i really encourage and a lot of times you know the bulls spend some time separated from the cows they spend some time resting under a tree or something like that but when we go out to to bring salt or check on the cows or do whatever we're doing checking the water make sure you get the bulls up because if you can imagine an injured bull is probably going to lay around under a tree well that's what healthy bulls do too so i can't tell the difference by that so i need to get them up move them around watch them move watch the feet and legs Look at that underbelly where if they have a broken penis or something like that, you'll see a big swelling along the underline. So I'm just looking at the overall health of the bull. Does he look and act healthy? Uh, his eyes, you know, no pink eye. He's not lost a lot of weight. He's, he's moving well. Those are all indications that he's probably still fertile. And so I'm, I'm looking for evidence that he's not because nothing will destroy a breeding season success faster than the bull's not breeding and that and that check can actually once you get in the habit of doing it can take less time than it did as we were just describing it right it, it oh. doesn't take very long you, it doesn't take very long just basically or... put eyes on him and kind of know what you're looking at i'm, I'm yeah. i want to watch him walk i want to look under that underline and i just kind of want to look at him does he look healthy and right. you know that doesn't take very long uh, i just need to be in the habit i need to yeah. take the extra effort to actually get them up and move them around a little bit while i'm out there checking water or salt or doing whatever i'm doing in the pasture K-State's Bob Larson there, along with Brad White and Dustin Pindle. To subscribe to the Cattle Chat podcast, go to beefcattleinstitute.org. That again is beefcattleinstitute.org. This is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson here. Well, the Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report is out from the USDA for this week and for the week ending this past Sunday. Our topsoil moisture supplies in the state, still ample to say the least, 38% surplus, 61% adequate, only 1% short to very short. And subsoil moisture, 36% surplus, 63% adequate, only 1% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop this week, 57% good to excellent. 30% fair, 13% poor to very poor. Winter wheat headed at 95% now, coloring at 16%. That's still well behind the 48% average for the date. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 43% good to excellent, 40% fair, and 17% poor to very poor. Corn planting, 79% done. That's behind the 93% average. Emergence is at 60%. Soybean planting, 26% now, 53% is the average for the date, and emergence at 16%, and grain sorghum planting at 8%, well behind the 26% average. Range and pasture conditions are at 71%, good to excellent, 25% fair, and 4% poor to very poor in Kansas. For the National Crop Condition and Progress update now, we turn to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says major crop planting is still way behind schedule. Even with skies clearing at the end of last week, progress for corn and soybean planting across the Midwest was very disappointing again for the week ending June 2nd. First, he looks at corn. Only two-thirds of the nation's acreage, 67 percent, planted by the 2nd of June. That is by far a record, previous record, 77 percent on that date in 1995. Also far behind the five-year average of 96 percent. Then at soybeans. Just 39 percent of the soybeans planted by June 2nd. That also is a record, previous record, 40 percent complete on that date in 1995. That 39 percent is 40 percentage points behind the five-year average of 79 percent. Both soy and corn emergence numbers also are at record lows. Rippey says the winter wheat crop overall is looking healthy. Especially in the hard red winter wheat belt, nationally 64% of the winter wheat rated good to excellent, up three points from last week, just 9% very poor to poor. That's steady from last week. Far better than last year, 37% good to excellent, 35% very poor to poor. He says there are lingering condition issues. Due to wetness and just general disease pressure, in the soft red winter wheat belt where it's been incessantly rainy. He also has the first look at spring wheat conditions. It's a bit of good news. We have not had the extreme rain in a lot of the northern spring wheat production areas, especially near the Canadian border. As a result, the overall good to excellent rating, 83% good to excellent on June 2nd, just 1% very poor to poor, and that compares favorably to last year's numbers. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now, yesterday, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture gave the latest on if and how prevented plantings could be included as part of the recently announced trade mitigation package. The USDA's Rod Bain has more. Producers have been waiting for specific details about the Agriculture Department's trade mitigation package, and in particular, how preventative plantings might factor into possible payments to impacted producers. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue told reporters Monday that when it comes to the preventative plantings matter... I hope to have a conclusion and a definitive answer to those producers very soon, hopefully by the end of the week. Secretary Perdue says USDA is studying the legality of including preventative plantings in some form as part of a trade mitigation package. I don't know, frankly, whether we can legally do it or not. We're investigating that as we speak. You have to have something to sell or to trade for a tariff impact. So we're looking at it from a legal perspective. And Secretary Purdue emphasized again the importance of crafting a trade mitigation package that would not impact planting intentions. We want them to make that decision based on the way they would ordinarily, not try to farm the program. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And next up, this week's Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning where we might be in terms of forage supply as we finish up fall harvest here in a few months. Recent rains and continued rain has delayed many plantings 
across the state. And as a result, we may not have quite as much corn silage as we would have liked to have had for storage for the rest of 2019 and 2020. So I think now is probably a good time to begin planning what you might do if you're short on forage. There are some things we do have options. One of the things we're blessed with here in Kansas is that we do have the availability of a lot of byproducts that contain a lot of fiber. Things like corn gluten feed, soybean hulls, and wheat mids. These are three primary sources of feed that we could use to extend limited forage availability for feeding in the next year. Do these come at an increased cost? Yes, they probably will come at a bit of an increased cost over raising our own forages. However, if we're in a situation where we have not been able to raise enough forage to meet our needs, we really need to consider these types of feedstuffs as a way to extend current forage supplies. So here are some things that I would suggest to our Kansas dairy farmers. Number one, take a careful inventory of the forage that you actually have on hand in storage today taking a look at how you might stretch that a little bit further than what you planned. That may mean that we turn to some of these high-fiber byproducts sooner rather than later. Running out of things like corn silage is not probably an ideal thing in terms of milk production. So if we can reduce the amount of corn silage that we're feeding now, incorporating some of these byproducts into the diet, that will extend our current corn silage storage capacity, as well as providing us maybe with a little bit of relief if we do not harvest as much corn silage as we plan in the fall harvest season. Now, some other things to consider. We do have the ability to raise some other crops. There are some summer annuals that are still available and could be planted to provide forage for the herd. Obviously, one of those would be sorghum particularly forage sorghums. If you choose these, probably need to choose something that's going to have a very digestible fiber. So the BMRs probably are the way to go when it comes to that. That's the brown midrib hybrids. Those have a higher forage digestibility. Another thing to consider are the dwarf varieties if you're going that way. Dwarf varieties have a shorter internode, so they have a higher leaf area versus stem. As a result of that, we get more digestible feed and a higher net energy available to the animals when we raise those types of crops. Visit with your seed supplier about that. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to consider their forage supplies and needs over the next 12 to 14 months. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. For you now on Agriculture Today, our weekly segment on wildlife management featuring wildlife specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, today you've information on determining fish populations in farm ponds, and this is a highly important component of pond management, you say. Yes, this is the time of year that I get calls from folks that are sampling their farm pond. They're not satisfied with the fishing. They're either not catching uh, the right species of fish, the right size of fish, or catching fish at all. Uh, They think they've done a good job of stocking the pond, and we've provided recommendations on farm pond stocking several times in the past. But for some reason, the pond is not producing as they had anticipated. Sometimes that's because of improper harvest of fish. That probably is the number one cause of poor Kansas farm pond fishing, but there are also some steps to take before you try to come up with the right management plan to fix those objectives. And one of the first things is, as you suggested, and that's determining the fish population and the the balance of different species of fish in the pond. We need a a combination of, of species in the pond to provide forage and to provide predators. And that starts at the bottom of a food web. 
But the question becomes, how do we determine what that balance is? And what are the recommended methods for doing just that then? Well, it can be done in a couple of different ways. Uh, I like to think that the easiest way is just by sampling the pond with fishing. You have to fish the pond intensively, keep track of the species that you've caught and their sizes. But when you do that, you can't just be trying to catch large bass. You need to be trying to catch small forage fish, large fish. So it takes some intensive effort using different types of fish lures or attractants or baits in order to get a good sample of the fish in the pond. Many people run out of energy or perhaps their enjoyment comes only from catching bass. So that's often not the best way for some folks to sample a pond. Seining or using a net to capture fish is a pretty quick and easy way to determine the condition of your pond. You can make an investment in a good 20 to 30 foot seine. I like to see those seines, minnow sized seines with a quarter inch mesh. Or you can buy a couple of the 10 foot long minnow seines, tie them together with no gaps in the center, and make sure that you get several seine hauls around the pond. One type of technique is to simply anchor one end of the seine up to the bank, take it out perpendicular from the bank, and then swing it around in about a 90 degree so that you capture fish uh, in that swinging gate method. The other is to take the, the seine out into the water, maybe 10 to 15 feet from the shoreline, and take it perpendicular back to the pond bank. Do that several times around the farm pond, usually at least three locations around the pond, and examine what you've captured. Once you've made several seine hauls, you've got a list of species and sizes that you've captured, then you can make the proper assessment of what needs to be done in the pond. Well, how does one interpret their inventory then to determine what the balance should be for that pond? Well, just simply look at the species and the lengths that you've caught in your seine haul or in your fishing catch. If there are no young bass present and you have many recently hatched bluegill or red-eared sunfish and no more than one or two mid-sized sunfish, it tells me that the population is bass crowded. If there are no young bass present and no recently hatched bluegill or red-eared sunfish and many mid-sized sunfish present, it tells me that it's forage fish or bluegill crowded. If young bass are present and many recently hatched sunfish with just a few mid-sized sunfish present, it tells me that it's a balanced population, and that's what we want. We want a population that shows several different species of different age classes, If young bass are present in the pond and no recently hatched sunfish or bluegill or no mid-sized sunfish present, it tells me that the pond is bass crowded and your forage fish may be completely absent. If there are few or no young bass in the pond and few or no bluegill in the pond and you have some other species of fish like carp or suckers or bullheads, or perhaps all green sunfish, that's an undesirable fish population, and you're probably going to need to take different management action to solve that problem compared to either a bass-crowded or bluegill forage fish-crowded pond situation. And do those particular guidelines apply to uh, sampling by fishing as well, not just seining, right? Yeah, it's very similar. Typically, you're going to be dealing with some larger fish. You're going to be catching smaller fish. With the seine, then you're going to be uh, recording your fishing catch, but it provides the same type of information. You'll determine whether the pond is bass crowded, forage fish crowded, or a balanced population. Once you determine the population condition, then you can determine what type of management action is necessary to get the pond up to meeting your expectations. Keep in mind, we have maybe more than 100,000 farm ponds in Kansas. This is a year that it seems uh, most of the state has ample water. 
Uh, some of those ponds uh, perhaps are going to be need to be restocked because maybe they'd been dry in the past. This is the time of year with these high water events that fish move upstream. Uh, and they can move against the current and get into ponds that previously you had thought uh, did not have some undesirable fish populations. Fish can also flood out or wash out of ponds. So it's important to determine a population condition and the species that are present in your farm pond for your long-term enjoyment of that fishing pond. And as Charlie says, the next move then is to amend those imbalances in your fish populations. And next week, we'll get into the tactics for doing just that. Charlie, thanks for the word this week on identifying those fish populations and their proportion to each other in your farm pond. Charlie Lee is a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. With that, our Tuesday edition comes to a close. We appreciate you tuning in and welcome you right back here this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.